Hello and welcome back to the channel and thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Some weeks ago I was at the detox fair in Wiltshire and uh, a young gentleman saw me, knew I had the channel and thrust a book into my hand. Little did I know that I would be sitting there for many hours it's a big book, um, absolutely totally absorbed in a new theory for potentially uh, understanding what cancer is. And we're going to be talking about this. Now, this is a very difficult subject in some ways on a channel like this on YouTube because there are certain things that um, certain bodies are not very happy about us saying. So we may dance through a few of the problems uh, like walking on eggshells however so but never mind that we're going to do the best we can my guest is ready and waiting he's written this marvelous book which is very easy to read and when he thrust it in my hand I said to him look um, I'm not very good at this technical stuff if it's easy for a layman to read I'll be able to cope he said I've written it so that my mother and father can read it I thought well okay I'll give it a go and it is very readable despite its size it's called the cancer resolution or is that resolution cancer reinterpreted through another lens Mark Linton is my guest he has a totally new theory on how cancer is caused and he joins me now hello Mark hi Richard thank you for having me on the show it's an absolute pleasure. Now, let me say, your book, I was, I was very hesitant about diving into it because it's not a subject that I know a lot about. It's not a subject that I would normally put on the channel because of the fair, fair restrictions that we have, especially talking about these sort of things. So um, I'm just a little bit uh, cautious how we go with this, but you know this situation as well because I dare say you've been in various environments where you've had to sort of hold your tongue a little bit in certain things but we're not trying to say that we have a solution to completely getting rid of but we're offering a different understanding if I've got this right of what causes it and possible things that we can do absolutely so um it's essentially a new theory and it isn't yet proven so um we can't say that we would never use the word cure or um, uh, solving the disease or anything like that because it needs to go through the normal processes uh, of being tested and verified. Right. Um, now, having said that, it is a quite a rather large book and um, it's taken me eight years to research. The book is supported by over 800 uh, references. And um, just to give some idea of the support from the medical community, um, after I wrote the book, I, I reached out to a cancer charity called Yes to Life in the UK. They're a fantastic charity. And I pitched the theory to them and they they highlighted that, well, it needs to be evaluated in a scientific fashion. So we'll do an event. We'll create an event. And the event was held in February. And the event took place uh, in the sense of we arranged to have 10 cancer um, international cancer scientists, some clini clinicians and scientists and patient experts to evaluate my theory in real time in front of an audience of over 200 medical professionals. So this went on for six hours. I presented my research. Uh, it was critiqued. I debated the fundamentals of the theory. And throughout that process, I was uh, uh, the delegates were able to vote on key aspects of the theory, give a confidence vote. And at the end, the confidence votes were uh, amalgamated and um, they came out at 7.4 out of 10. So 10 is absolute confidence in the new theory um, and its concepts and nor is no confidence. And it was 7.4, which is, um, I think, quite a remarkable result uh, from um, presenting such a new theory over that length of time. So from that, it's been validated to the extent that um, it's been seen by experts in the field who um, highlight that it, it warrants further investigation. So it's now essentially a valid theory that needs to be um, addressed and looked at. And I mean, where you go with it, and, and, and I don't want to go there immediately, but where you go with it there, I mean, you're, you're really highlighting the fact that perhaps the, <clears throat> the traditional or the more modern traditional methods of treating this um, frightening disease perhaps is a lot simpler than we're led to believe 
and um, need not be quite so frightening as once you've been given the diagnosis may seem. Is that fair? Yes. Um, in effect, it is a scary disease and it's incredibly complex. And um, we don't actually, I think the issue is that we don't actually understand the underlying cause. So the reason why I've written another, another theory, and I didn't intend to set out to do so, is that um, as soon as you do a bit of research, you realize that there are actually seven, at least seven different theories of cancer. So what we know from this is that scientists do not um, all agree on what the underlying cause of the disease is. And um, generally speaking, uh, if you have ident successfully identified the underlying mechanism that drives any particular disease, you technically should then be able to treat it effectively. So what we're finding with um, the current approach is that um, most oncologists subscribe to the theory that cancer is a genetic disease. We're treating it from this perspective. Um, however, we're, we're clearly not getting the results we would like. It's not, we're not, you know, these treatments are, are good for some people, but for most people, they're not fantastic. And that they, they, there could be improvements on this. So for instance, if you actually look at, um, and this is why it's so important for cancer patients, I think, to realize that there's so many different theories out there and the cause of cancer is unknown, is because um, there are several other theories. And one of them uh, is the metabolic theory. And that would be uh, the rival theory to the current established paradigm that cancer is a genetic disease. Now, the metabolic theory suggests that cancer is a, a, a metabolic disease. So there's an energy abnorm abnormality in all cancer cells in all solid cancers, uh, in the sense that the energy system of a cell switches abnormally to a, its backup energy system, if you will. Um, and that, that progresses the hallmarks of the disease and causes uh, tumor development. So uh, this theory itself has different treatments that can be applied. Um, now, the, is the issue is that when you and we can talk about this in a little bit more detail you can assess the accuracy of, of each theory and the the important thing about each theory is that each theory um well treatments are developed from theory so the more accurate a theory is the more likely the treatments are going to be more beneficial and more effective um and there there are a set of hallmarks that all these theories are trying to explain there's at the moment officially 10 hallmarks uh, of cancer that are shared between all solid um, solid cancers. Now, um, the more hallmarks that can be explained by any particular theory, the greater the accuracy and therefore the greater the, the, uh, the efficacy of the treatment. Now, by my analysis, and people may contend my analysis, not saying it's, it's, it's correct necessarily, but my, by my analysis, uh, the DNA theory, the primary theory that oncologists subscribe to can only explain around two of those hallmarks. So there's some issues there. Now, this could be that um, cancer is extremely uh, complex and we just need to take more time to delve deeper and, and the somatic mutation theory or the DNA theory will then later be able to actually explain the disease, more hallmarks, but at present it can't. So there's a big question mark over why. The metabolic theory can explain at least seven. Proponents of the metabolic theory say it can explain all 10, but I've got this, this contention with three that I have. But anyway, this indicates that the metabolic theory has identified a key aspect of the disease that's driving or a mechanism that's, that appears to be driving the disease. And what we find in the real world data is that, yes, that there, there is a metabolic shift in in pretty much all cancers. So this indicates because the metabolic theory can explain more hallmarks that it's a more accurate theory compared to the genetic theory as it currently stands now that would suggest that um, we should be offering cancer patients metabolic treatments because there are a number of metabolic approaches that can be applied and professor seafried who's the main advocate for the metabolic theory at the moment he has spoken at length about this on many many podcasts um so i think the issue for for people listening to this is that Science isn't settled. It never really is. Um, there are seven different theories of cancer, at least eight, if now you include mine. Um, the only real real way to effectively treat the disease or, or discover an effective treatment is to actually identify the underlying cause. 
from my perspective and my research, we haven't yet found the underlying cause. Um, my research points in one particular di direction that is quite separate from the mainstream view of the disease. And the reason why it's so important to, to try and understand my theory, I think, is because my theory is the first one to explain all 10 hallmarks. So that indicates at the very least I've identified an overlooked or, or feature of the disease that hasn't been identified before. Uh, and if targeted, it, it has the potential to improve uh, treatment for cancer patients. Um, on the flip side of that, if you want to go the other way, uh, it indicates that I might have identified the underlying cause if there is one underlying cause or a number of the underlying causes. So, and on top of that, I just also want to say, as I was doing my research, um, I came across a number of other features of the disease. So such as iron overload. Um, why was, why is iron associated with cancer? Um, and I found there were about 20 of these different features and a number of the mainstream theories couldn't explain most of them. So I thought, well, if, if my theory has any credibility, then I need to be explaining these two. So I have within my book, I explain all 20 of these on top of the 10 official uh, hallmarks. So by doing that, that adds further validity to the theory, further weight to the theory. It doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. Like I say, we need to test it. But I just wanted to kind of summarize the, the situation for everybody to realize that there's hope because there are other perspectives of perspectives of the disease and there's other possible treatment modalities that are associated with these different theories and they vary in accuracy. And this is inf critical information that should be provided to and often isn't provided to cancer patients. And I'd like to just say that you are in the book a quite scathing about, if I can put it in those terms, about the one way that uh, the the current way of dealing it with the, the sort of state hospitals that we have here um, in that there seems to be this one route towards um, a service to help people and this is sort of based I think you said in the book in 1980s technology that's not really changed very much since then which you know a lot of things have happened a lot of people come forward and as you say there is your theory and, and, and other theories and what I found really fascinating, and I don't mean that in a negative way that you're scathing about it, is that actually you're giving the the reader and anybody who has had this um, awful or frightening diagnosis a chance to question when they are talking to their GPs or the consultants, is this the only way of doing it? Because as you mentioned in the book, you have these hallmarks which if, if you're able to present the argument, you might help even the consultants think twice about whether they're giving you the right treatment, um, whether it's your treatment or even just to give you a different treatment. And, and this seems to be a very important aspect of your book is that you're stating, look, <clears throat> you're, you get guided down this one path because that's what everybody believes that the genetic, the DNA theory is the central theory and yet there seems to be arguments for a far better theory that may you know even the metabolic theory on its own yeah. is a far better approach um, so maybe you could just tell us just briefly then why is it that the DNA theory the genetic theory is is taken to be the only approach that um, big hospitals, the NHS, and, and all of those sorts of organizations will follow. Absolutely. So um, in, in effect, in 1953, when um, the structure of DNA was identified by Francis and Crick, you know, there was this excitement about um, studying the nucleus and the DNA. It's, it's almost like the, the God, the God particle in, in the sense that you can manipulate cells and literally control illness in, in a sense and, and understand how the body works. And there's all sorts of positive and potentially negative implications of that, but it's, it's an exciting field. Um, and at that time, actually, the metabolic theory was already uh, being presented by a guy called Otto Warburg in the 1920s. But in between, in between that, we had a, a world war. 
Um, and then, you know, 1953, like I say, um, the structure of DNA was discovered and then excitement grew around that. And the metabolic theory kind of fell off and all the attention was really focused on DNA and trying to understand the DNA genes that drive drive um, uh, evolution, essentially. And from that, you, you had more investment into the project, more so in other fields. And it just grew. It grew from there and then became the notion that cancer was effectively a, a genetic based disease in the sense that they were scientists were noticing uh, mutations in cancer cells specifically, uh, particular damage was being was, was occurring. Um, and then, you know, we saw relationships, certain relationships with certain genes. The P53 gene, for instance, it's a cell death gene. That's that's classed as the the most um, mutated DNA gene in cancer. And that and if you can't, if the cell can't die, then you know you're going to get an overgrowth of cells. So there was this relationship in the medical industry, uh, in science, this interest, uh, and a lot of funding went into um, understanding genetics. Uh, and then that's really where the uh, genetic or the somatic mutation theory developed from. Um, and unfortunately, um, it became the de facto uh, theory. And, and, and through the medical education system, it is the primary theory that is pushed. And it's only really in the 1980s uh, that um, other scientists were questioning the theory and looking towards the metabolic theory. And it, it, it came back to life in effect. Um, you've always had several other theories, bacterial theories, um, aneuploid theory, but we've recently had the addition of the atavistic theory and the tissue organization field theory. So these are our recent components. Um, so that kind of explains why there's been this focus on DNA and the DNA theory. Um, and quite simply at the moment, I think the problem again still is the fact that if you go into medical school and you, you want to help um, develop treatments for cancer, you are educated to believe that the genetic theory is 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 factual is is correct even though it's not proven so the bulk of um education around cancer is based on this particular theory that's why it's so dominant that's why oncologists pretty much only talk about it and you very rarely hear about these other theories which is very unfortunate because um and I understand it because oncologists are, are so incredibly busy. Uh, this, this disease is, is growing uh, in its um, influence over the population. So, and, and oncologists just want to do the right thing. They've been trained in this view of the disease and they're just trying to save patients as best they can within this system. It's really the system that needs to change and, and maybe the education system needs to change just to uh, adopt a more objective view which would be to look more substantially at the other theories that are present, including mine, as well as the metabolic theory, um, the cancer stem cell theory, and all these other theories that are there. It, there's just a disproportion, unfortunately, uh, of attention uh, focused on the DNA theory. We'll get onto your theory in a second. Um, it, some of the treatments for the conventional method uh, which we said it sort of dates back to the 1980s, chemotherapy and various other bits and pobs. Um, like so much in the pharmaceutical industry with the little white pills, things come with side effects. And some of these can be quite detrimental to patients in order to get rid of something. Sometimes it does seem like you're smashing a walnut with a sledgehammer in order to, to do that. Your theory takes us well away from all of that, which we'll, we'll explore in a second. Um, why do you think that even though the treatment has these rather terrible um, side effects that actually sometimes the way, and the way you've described it so eloquently in that you have a five-year period, I think it is, where you can test people and say, yeah, yeah, it's worked. But after five years, some of the side effects come back to haunt people. And actually, they may die as a result of that, but it's not actually counted. Why do you think these, this, this treatment is continued, even though it seems to be not terribly effective? Um, again, I think it's the, the lack of focus on um, the other theories and the other perspectives about the disease. And a lot of the funding has gone into these chemotherapies. Um, and the way I kind of look at it is that essentially it's it, 
the current way that the mainstream that mainstream medicine treats the disease and views the disease and analyzes the disease it's like a huge juggernaut it's like a big train this this huge juggernaut and it's going down the track and it's very difficult to stop um we've got all these theories and all these people now peeling off from the mainstream theory and saying hey look we need to be looking at this and voicing their concerns about the path in which we're taking but because it's there's so much investment involved mm. um it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of people pushing back uh, and voicing concerns and highlighting other theories for um, those in the industry to actually start taking note and retracing their steps. I mean, it must be a very difficult thing for, um, say, a scientist who's worked all their, all their life on understanding a one particular theory, say the DNA theory, and they've studied one aspect of, of genetics and they're treating patients to then be told that what they've studied for 40 years is potentially wrong or, you know, there's these, this other area that they should re also be studying. I mean, they, they probably don't have the time to do that, but it must be, you know, quite quite difficult to accept that that's the case. So that's why I view it as this juggernaut. It's, it, it takes time for people to listen to these other perspectives and then maybe adopt them. At first, there's always a, a, a reaction uh, um, a negative reacting, reaction to change, isn't there? People don't like change. So I, I think it's it's it, it's part of that. It's this huge juggernaut. It's going to take time, but it needs exposure. The only way to change it is exposure, like doing wonderful podcasts like yourself and and, and Dr. Professor Seafree talking about his theory, as he, as he has done on many other podcasts, and other people talking about, and just cancer patients conversing with their oncologists and saying, look, what about the metabolic theory? What about these other treatments? What about this new theory that Mark's putting out there? Um, that will all help um, change the paradigm. We've seen uh, some of these very big theories that has have had huge amounts of investment, which not everybody questions. Um, one of those which is perhaps less contentious than it was now is the old business about man-made global warming, in which many people say the science is fixed and other people are challenging it, saying, well, you know, perhaps it isn't. Um, but then we also see the, the the locking down on that, that no, 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 we don't want to listen to the alternative. And we saw that globally with the uh, medical intervention that happened after the business in 2020 when we had a virus flying around, in which, again, people are questioning a certain approach. <laughs> and, and that one is another medical thing. And now we're seeing that perhaps that isn't perhaps as the best advantage that we, we could have done. Uh, and there may have been various other motives in there, but we're not talking about that today. So obviously, the more exposure and the more... I would have just thought that we're in a world now where we've seen the errors of these big... Um, we, we only go by this because it's, it's... And we're not going by any theories. You would think that people are going to be a bit more open-minded, hopefully. But also, as you alluded to there, there's a huge amount of financial investment and probably incentives from various bodies that... Um, prefer it to stay that way let's move then to how your theory is is different okay um if i may i'll just share my screen yeah sure okay okay can you see that richard i can right okay this is so probably easy just to have a graphic on screen it's always easy, always easier than just talking about a complex subject absolutely so um here we have essentially carcinogens and infection uh, generating the initial conditions of cancer. And these run down into some of the hallmarks. These are not all of them. These are just some key aspects of the disease that are shared between all cancers. And then that obviously leads to cancer. OK, so these are uh, we need to explain these with any given theory. Now, this is how um, this, this is the I think is the flaw in our current thinking on cancer is that um, cancer is seen as a, a malfunction disease. So we've got carcinogens and infection coming in, causing inflammation and cell damage. And it's it's assumed in many cases that the cell has malfunctioned. So the cell has gone rogue. Um, it's developed a mind of its own. It's almost like a new species. The, the cell is no longer working for our benefit. It's, you know, it's developed a mind of its own. So we must attack the cell. We must attack the cell. So all the theories, all the mainstream theories um, that are listed here fall under this paradigm. So you could argue that there's one particular theory 
which is the cell malfunction theory of cancer. Mm. All these different theories are just uh, try, trying to establish which part of the cell is actually damaged and causing the disease. So somatic mutation theory, which is the DNA theory, is saying that uh, DNA mutations drive the disease. The metabolic theory is saying that an abnormal energy system drives the disease. So all these, th all these theories are attempting to explain all these through the damage that is caused to the cell because that's thought to actually cause it. Now, the problem I've found is that um, most of the disease cannot be explained because we can't find the pattern of damage that would normally explain all aspects of these hallmarks. So there's because there's, there, there's a randomness uh, to the disease. So with these hallmarks, there's a consistency. This essentially is the consistency because it occurs in all solid cancers. So we get this random DNA damage caused viewed through this lens of cell malfunction, and we can't explain a number of these hallmarks. It, so in essence, at the moment, we can't explain cancer because we can't identify the exact pattern of damage that causes it. So I recognized quite early on that um, the metabolic theory is key because this energy shift does occur in cancer, uh, in all, pretty much all cancers. And this does seem to highlight the consistency of the disease. It does seem to explain the consistency of the disease. The only problem with the metabolic theory is that they can't find specific uh, consistent um, damage to the mitochondria in the cell in order to explain why the energy shift occurs. So I'm offering a completely different um, perspective and this is from the sense that cancer is actually a cell suppression disease rather than a cell malfunction disease the cell our cells aren't working against us they're always trying to work or generally always trying to work for us and what i noticed was that um what was key about the metabolic theory being as accurate as it is uh, seven out of ten hallmarks it explains is that this energy switch shift occurs and it's known as the Wahlberg effect so you get this Wahlberg effect energy shift in cancer cells um, now i'm I'm arguing that uh, the metabolic theory hasn't quite explained why this transition, this energy transition to the Warburg effect occurs, because I'm saying it's not the damage to mitochondria that triggers it. The mitochondria uh, are, say, the, the primary energy system of the cell. Glycolysis is the backup energy system. So you've got primary and a backup. Cancer cells revert to the backup energy system of glycolysis, and that's known as the Warburg effect. So I started asking the question, well, um, what if there's a different explanation for the Warburg effect? Because this is a key feature of cancer. If you can identify another cause of the Warburg effect, you might get closer to identifying the underlying cause of the disease because whatever's driving the Warburg effect is likely the underlying uh, mechanism driving the rest of the disease. So um, I later on stumbled across um, a, uh, a paper in immunology and it was talking about how pathogens, uh, how cells were... Um, respond to pathogens and infection and it's it mentioned the, the, the word a they trigger a warburg like effect now this is basically that they trigger this warburg effect we see in cancer and i realized that actually um, infection can explain why we have this energy shift occurring in cancer so um the next question was well what happens if the pathogen is sustained within the cell then the Warburg effect remains. And this is what we see happening in cancer. Um, and then the question becomes after that, well, okay, so what else can happen? What else What else uh, do these pathogens um, lead to? Well, they, they when you actually start looking at the research and you start identifying how they relate to all the hallmarks, for instance, the cell death mechanism is uh, seems to be blocked in cancer, you realize that these pathogens can survive within the cell. And in order to do so, they block the cell death mechanism on purpose. It's beneficial for them to survive within the cell because they gain access to the nutrients that are provided within the cell. So we now have an issue where I can explain the Warburg effect and the cell death mechanism by this intracellular infection, this abnormal intracellular infection that occurs, it's opportunistic, um, which explains why cancer cells don't die and why they grow out of control because the Warburg effect is a proliferative state. So in effect, um, it's very easy to show, in theory, that an infection can, if it's sustained, can generate abnormal uh, tumour growth. And then I went on from there to show that um, there's evidence to show that these pathogens can independently um, generate all of the hallmarks. 
Now, the other question is, um, are these pathogens present in cancer? Because, you know, at this stage, it's just a theory. Let's have a look at real world data and find out if they're present. And uh, up until around 2012 and 2017, it was assumed that tumors were sterile, but Ravid Straussman's work showed that actually um, tumors harbor their own microbiome. That is their own uh, combination of bacterial and fungal pathogens. So they're present in all cancers. So now it's a question of whether they just colonize the tumor after the effect, after the effect that it's, it's developed or they actually cause it. And here I show with my theory that um, uh, through evidence show exactly the mechanism by which the pathogen is able to instigate the disease. And I'm able to explain all of these uh, hallmarks essentially and the consistency of, of cancer itself uh, and why so many different carcinogens that cause different damage is able to generate cancer, which is something that the theories on the opposite side of the scale uh, are struggling uh, to explain. And can you just explain, um, Mark, I'll put you back on there, why the cancer can spread around the body if it's if it's in one little area to begin with, and then even though that might be targeted and, and cut out, for example, it can still turn up in different parts that it somehow moved about? That's a great question. Um, that's, not, that's actually not a question I've been asked before. Um, but the simple answer to that would be, well, arguably from the mainstream perspective, perspective you'd say hey, we've cut out all the tumour, so the offending cells are gone. But what I'm saying is that, well, the tumour isn't the problem, the cells aren't the problem, it's the infection. So what you have is you can actually cut out the infection within the tumour itself, get rid of that. But um, fungal pathogens and bacteria, they spread throughout the body generating biofilms. So they actually exist within the tissue itself. So if you continue with the lifestyle that you that develop cancer in the first place, which is uh, generating chronic inflammation, so you're not eating good food, you're nutrient deficient, you're getting pesticides in your body, so you're creating this environment which actually weakens the immune system at the site of damage the, or the chronic inflammation. If you still have those pathogens present within that tissue, which you will do, because unless you've got rid of the biofilm, which is very difficult to get rid of, then you've got the same situation happening again. You, those pathogens will take advantage when the opportune moment arises, the cells are weakened, it will invade those cells. And if the pathogen cannot be uh, eliminated, the Warburg effect will be triggered. They will suppress the uh, um, uh, cell death mechanism again, and you've got a slow growing tumor again. And, and you, I think the other key aspect is that within that environment, you've got a corrosive environment um, where the cells, the tumor cells, which are trying to defeat the pathogen but can't, are producing excessive lactic acid uh, and also iron overload. And these two compounds, they suppress immune cells at the site of damage. The immune cells cannot get through. It's, it's, it's almost like there's, I want to say a shield, but um, a, an area surrounding the cell, the, the tumor, where it's toxic. Incidentally, fungal pathogens uh, feed on lactate and iron. So you have this environment where it supports the pathogen once it's taken advantage of the damage that's caused and it suppresses the immune system. There's various other reasons why that, that I go into in my book in more detail, but effectively why um, um, metastasis works, uh, it's able to spread is in layman's terms, you've got a growing corrosive environment, which means that the, the bonds that hold the cells together over time break down. Um, and also this corrosive environment triggers the growth of blood vessels. So an overproduction of lactic acid by itself triggers the growth of blood vessels. Uh, and we can go into that later if, if you want. Um, but that then allows these cells to break away in now the, the even damaged blood vessels because they're porous because of the lactic acid buildup. Um, and then that allows these cells to, to go off and migrate through the bloodstream and then they end up um, getting stuck somewhere else and then continuing to grow. And there's there's obviously reasons why that happens uh, that I explain in my book. But essentially, the the um, the uh, fungal pathogens uh, travel with the um, tumors, the, the part of the tumor that travels uh, and metastasizes. As well as those other features like exosomes are packages by which the uh, primary tumor will talk to the secondary tumor and keep on triggering growth signals. Right. There's a lot of 
technical stuff in in all of that and i and i'm hoping that the the audience is still with me because it can be a very um technical subject the way you know you're talking it into Sorry. extremely no 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 but it's what you do and this is how you understand it and, and, and from a layman's term it can be easy to to get a little bit lost when you're trying to condense it in a podcast like this but let me say having sat and read here you forensically take each part um you take each bit apart and you explain each bit and that is really useful from a, a reader of particularly a layman and you did say to me at the uh, at the detox fair you written it so your mum and dad could read it and you do explain like you explain about the energy system of how uh, and now I'm going to bastardize this because I can't remember all the terms, but how we have one system, but there's a sort of backup system that kicks in when there's a problem. And then when that problem is gone, we go back to the main system. But what can happen is that we get stuck on the backup system and then the backup system, which shouldn't be running all the time, is running. And then that causes things to happen which are not good for us. I put it in very, very basic terms. But is that about right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the two things that strike me that audiences will be very interested in is you talk about the um, carcinogenics right at the beginning of your um, schematic drawing and then the inflammation. And then, of course, what we do about it at, at the other end. One of the things that anybody who's been to a GP, um, the thing that they never get asked about is what is the environment that they live in or what are they eating and those sort of things. The, it, it's almost as if how you live has not really affected anything that you yeah. do. And yet clearly from how you later go on into the book, it, it starts from how you're living your life. And you, you alluded to that just now when you were saying, you know, if you're eating crap foods and things like that, it's not going to help the the getting rid of this problem. So could you tell us something a little bit about the sort of things that might be taking us to the point where the cell is actually beginning to break down and struggle because of what we do in our lives? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, one of these 10 hallmarks, one of the hallmarks is um, inflammation, chronic inflammation. So generally, most disease arises from chronic inflammation. You'll see that in, in most of the disease that um, um, scientists speak of and that's generally because um we're essentially we, we have a lifestyle and we're consuming uh foods and nutrients that are actually detrimental to our cells our cells aren't used to consuming them so for instance um we've got this shift over to utilizing um vegetable oils now there's a there's a essentially the the wrong ratio of omega threes and omega sixes and omega sixes they, they compete with the receptors for omega three, so you get this inflammation arising because the cell can't deal with the issue. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, it, it's it, if you go into uh, the organic versus conventional pesticide grown food side of the debate, it is that we're being exposed to all these pesticides um, and an accumulation of uh, antibiotics uh, that is fed to cows in the agriculture industry and and all these um, uh, sort of pesticides that go on our food um, especially with, and with nutrient deficient food and with processed food w our bodies aren't used to this level of um, unnatural you could say uh, um, compounds so you have this this constant inflammation arising where your immune system is trying to remove particular toxins and in order to do that your cells um uh generate inflammation to alert the immune system to a particular problem and the immune system will come in and try and take remove it from the cell and what have you and that weakens the immune system at the same time um so you have this process where the terrain of the body is being damaged on a consistent basis if you aren't aware of the, the damaging the damage that the foods you are eating is causing it, it mean it seems simple, but we actually live in an environment where um, we're not really educated on the right types of food and, and advertisements are, are bound telling us, you know, we should eat this nice packaged food 
and it's not actually good for us. And we, we, we are told this message quite often that we need to eat better. We all know we need to eat more healthily. Um, but we don't, I don't think we realize to the extent that it's an issue because I think a lot of people are eating, are eating quite healthy. They're eating um, veg, a lot of vegetables and fruit and what have you. But if you're not eating organic, there's a big issue there because um, you're absorbing these pesticides and or, or non-organic food has been shown time and time again to be uh, less dense in nutrients. So there's all these issues that are building up over time and toxins are stored in fat. So if you're if you're eating too much sugar, then you're going to be storing more fat. So you're going to be storing more toxins over time, which then means when you are burning that fat, you're releasing toxins on top of the toxins you're consuming. So, you know, we're, we're generating this inflammatory environment. And um, from the perspective of, say, the, the genetic theory, they're saying that the reason why cancer occurs is because you're damaging your cells over and over again. And that re results in mutations and then cancer develops. Well, my perspective is that um, yeah, that that damage will have um, uh, uh, will will trigger help to trigger the disease. However, what you're doing is you're feeding the the pathogens that are are present throughout your body. They've colonized your body more so in some people than others, but they've col we're now finding them colonizing all sorts of tissue, including the brain, which we thought was completely sterile. And if they're present in that tissue, and you are damaging that tissue on a consistent basis. You are also going to give rise to helping them facilitate their um, uh, their ability to invade those cells. If you're consuming antibiotics without realizing it because you consume antibiotics in the food you're eating, um, then you're going to be destroying your microbiome. And your microbiome is key. The beneficial bacteria in your microbiome keep pathogens at bay. What we're finding in the West, and cancer is a disease of the West, by the way, um, we are finding that we are damaging not only the terrain of our cells themselves, but the microbiome, which actually forms up to 80% of our immune system. Now, this is quite incredible. The, the microbiome within the gut is, is very, very protective. It, it eliminates uh, toxins, it eliminates pathogens, and it breaks down our food for us so we can actually attain these nutrients. And it also provides us with particular nutrients that our body can't, uh, doesn't, produce itself so it's vitally important so all these factors come together to to show that we are actually deficient in a lot of things and we're causing this in, environment in which uh, damage occurs and of course then disease and also an environment which benefits pathogens that can take advantage of that and cause secondary disease on top so yeah it is i mean ult ultimately we're we're living in this very lazy lifestyle in which our food isn't food um, we're buying it from supermarkets, which is nutrient free and um, is covered in all these poisons, as you said. Most of our houses now have EMFs, which is also contributing. Um, we don't know quite what they're doing in the skies. Our water has got fluoride in. Um, uh, the uh, whole products at home are off gassing. Exactly. We live in this. So even though you you know you may sort of go oh well I've got you know yeah okay I've got this cancer I've been given this diagnosis of cancer because the 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 doctors are not suddenly saying look actually you need to eat a lot more healthily you need to go and do some exercise you need to get outside more get some vitamin C maybe not sit under strip lights in front of um, screens all day long no matter what your job is if you know and and you've got a better chance of not helping the cancer to develop um but we but doctors are not doing that they're just going oh okay we, we've got this treatment we'll we'll fast track you through as much as we can yeah i but think he, sorry to stop you there i think that the part of the problem is that this focus this abnormal um focus on the somatic mutation theory the dna theory because it's assumed that um during normal energy metabol metabolism you produce free radicals sometimes um and these free radicals are quite damaging. So over time, it's thought that these free radicals damage your cell and then you get mutations over time. And really the concept with the DNA theory and what most oncologists kind of um, believe is that cancer, really the cause of cancer is at, from bad luck. It's bad luck from uh, uh, generating um, the, this particular damage and it's at random and it, it can't be helped. So there's not this focus on looking at, the ter looking at health uh, yeah. and food because it's, it's more seen as a disease of the cell going wrong. And it just goes wrong a lot of the time by accident. And there's nothing we can do about it. And that takes power away from cancer patients, which is what I'm, yeah. trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to give back to cancer patients because I'm saying it's not, that's, 
you are in and in control of the environment you so prevention is a huge thing that's being discussed um within science at the moment when, regarding cancer and they've shown time and time again that you can change your environment you can change what food you eat and you would reduce your risk of cancer by a huge amount so there's a lot of evidence for that and of course our bodies if we were to treat them correctly would be doing pretty much most of the work most of the time and we wouldn't need to have too much medical intervention if we were looking after ourselves otherwise how how is it that we've got here after so many uh, thousands of years that we've been on this planet exactly so our bodies are, are designed to um uh, repair themselves if when given the right nutrients and yeah. the right environment um and i always point to the blue zones of the world i don't know if you you're aware of these um but do, do share dan uh boitner i'm not sure if i pronounce his surname right but he's just done a documentary on uh, netflix and um other channels are available by the way um <laughs> And he did a, a, a massive study into the most healthiest places on earth. And he found about five, which he named blue zones. And these are places like Okinawa, for instance. These are places where you have the uh, the largest number of uh, people that um, reach 100 and with the least amount of disease. So then he studied these five different areas all over the world. Um, and he found that a commonality between all of them. And uh, I, I I explain that in my book as well, what those commonalities are, but it generally is organic food, uh, exercise, good community, good uh, spirituality, um, healthy mind, um, eating locally, uh, and just being outside in the outdoors. And like I say it's it's as simple as that. And when you when you see what these these people are eating and the lifestyles they they are are uh, undertaking. It makes perfect sense as the reason why they live to that age with very little disease in the process. They are healthy. Um, it's not rocket science. It's just a lot of it's been corrupted. The information has been corrupted because, you know, certain interests are, are trying to sell certain products that aren't necessarily as beneficial for us. Yeah. And I mean, I think most of my viewers know exactly what you're talking about there. So. Getting towards the, the second half of the book, having sort of pushed away uh, conventional treatments, which as we explained, um, and then looking at your theory, the, the advice that you send people to as best as you can based on you know, what should work for your theory, let's put it that way, it, it seems to be just as what we've been talking about, changing your environment and, your, and what you consume. Yeah, first of all, I'm not a clinician, so um, any information I give is, you know, it's not medical advice, it's just information. Mm. Um, and what I try to do is try and link everything back to science and evidence. So you have the tissue organisation field theory, which basically talks about the terrain being bad. So what you've got to do is look after the terrain, and we've already discussed that. Um, then you've got the microbiome, so you need to establish why is your microbiome out of sync, which it is for most cancer patients. Uh, you need to address that by providing um, uh, an organic diet, for instance, probiotics, even a fecal transplant. You have um, Dr. William Lee is now pioneering this this idea of uh, a beneficial diet, but also uh, a, a fecal transplant, which is where you take the healthy microbiome of someone who's got a good, good microbiome and you transplant that into someone who hasn't. And they, that repopulates their microbiome. And they're seeing dramatic effects in terms of benefit benefits to health. So the microbiome is incredibly incredibly important um then for me it would be you know because the, of the metabolic theory and how accurate that is which highlights that cancer cells are absorbing a lot more glucose and glutamine um at a higher rate than healthy cells you can target that you can target and restrict glucose to a certain degree and restrict glutamine to a certain degree um now there is controversy over uh, glutamine i'll go into that in my book it might actually be more beneficial to supplement with glutamine because you're going to improve the immune system function and you're going to improve the gut microbiome. Um, so the jury's out on that aspect at the moment, but you can apply these metabolic therapies, which is like adopting a ketogenic diet for a short period of time, fasting, which incidentally can actually improve um, uh, the efficacy of some chemotherapy drugs. Um, if you are doing that before and after, um, obviously speak to a clinician about how to do that. Um, 
But yes, it's, it's addressing the uh, metabolism of the cell because the, the fundamental thing is the pathogen, the fungal pathogen itself, it's, its primary food source is glucose. So if you are restricting glucose based on the metabolic theory, you're also restricting glucose to the pathogen based on my theory, which you're, you're affecting both. Um, now, the final thing that I would add, because essentially the, the first three are steps that generally the metabolic theory and the tissue organization theory, build theory, if you put them all together, they are kind of saying what I'm saying there. Uh, the bit I'm saying is, is kind of missing and could probably improve things is to address the fungal pathogen, like directly. So that is to, uh, well, the first three steps I've talked about, that's addressing the fungal pathogen. You can direct, you can address the fungal pathogen also by using antifungal drugs. Now that is a little controversial because antifungal drugs can be toxic. So you've got to be careful with that. But the, I, I've got a number of studies in the book that show the efficacy of uh, particular antifungal drugs against uh, some uh, cancer with some patients. Um, but also, and the reason why I'm 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 pushing the theory is because there's a number of off-label drugs that you can use. There's, there's a lot of people uh, who are um, proposing off-label drugs, and there's there's, there's um, a private clinic in the UK called the Care Oncology Clinic. That's working alongside NHS uh, oncologists. They're oncologists in the private clinic themselves, and they provide four different off-label drugs. So metformin, which is a diabetic drug, uh, atorvastatin, which is a statin. Mabendazole, which is an antiparasitic, and doxycycline, which is an anti anti um, bacterial drug. Um, they prescribe them, and they're having some efficacy with them. Now, you can use them to target the metabolism in the cell, as per the metabolic theory. However, when you look at all these off-label drugs that appear to be effective, what you find is they're also antifungal. So, what I'm finding is there's this huge link with my theory, with everything that's going on with potential drugs that can be beneficial. Um, it's all linking back. It's all pointing towards this fungal aspect because they're also antifungal. Uh, tamoxif tamoxifen is something given to uh, breast cancer patients. That is also antifungal, aside from the estrogen, estrogen restricting uh, uh, properties it's actually been designed for. So, yes, it's it's targeting the fungal pathogen would be the last aspect. It's just understanding how to do that. And primarily, you would want to test uh, to find out what, mycotoxins um the toxins produced by fungi are in your body and what fungi are present preferably within the tumor and what uh, the, the health of your microbiome so if you can identify the potential pathogens the fungal pathogens that are present you can then specifically target them with uh, those specific antifungal drugs because not all not uh, one particular antifungal drug will not target every single pathogen that we know about so it's this additional path, this antifungal approach that I'm advocating for and seems to be already present in a lot of the protocols that are already being used and seem to have efficacy. I just don't think because I think the issue is because before my theory's been out there, we're not really focused on the potential of the fungal pathogen being the underlying mechanism driving the disease. So we're, we're not having as great a success as we would like because we're not specifically targeting it. But hopefully with my theory, we can, we can now do that and, uh, and improve outcomes. Your, your book is, um, is, as I said earlier, is, is a very readable book. It's not necessarily aimed at uh, doctors or um, specialists. It's, it's, it's aimed at anyone, really. And I think if anybody has been diagnosed or knows somebody who's diagnosed or is just interested in different approaches, this is uh, a very readable and... Um, a wealth of information offering a different perspective. Um, but if you just take the two ends of, of how you live your life at the beginning and some of the um, ideas that you have in the back, uh, it, it seems to me that that is just on an ordinary everyday basis a great way to keep yourself healthy um, and understanding in much better way what cancer is and what can go wrong and the various theories you you highlight that in the central um basis of the book which is um which is very good because i was really worried when you thrust it into my hands that i wouldn't be able to understand it and now i have a much better understanding of it and i hope that the audience can do that is this available in all good bookshops as they say it's available on Amazon at the moment, so um, I'm looking to get it into other bookshops as well. But yeah, it's available on Amazon, and uh, that can be purchased or 
Yeah, just obviously do a search for the book on Amazon. Well, I'll put a, I'll put a link in the description yeah. for for people if they're interested, so they can um, look at it. Um, what do you think? What's the prognosis then for your theory? What, what's the next stage? How do how do we progress that so that it can be tested and given a green light and maybe seen a change in the normal practice that we would see after you've been to the GP and been diagnosed? So after the event that I held in February, where I uh, presented my theory to a number of uh, medical professionals, a number of them are now working with me on a voluntary uh, on a voluntary basis. Uh, I meet with them every month, and what we're trying, what we're doing is we're establishing. We've got four potential um, trials we're looking to pursue uh, funding for. So we've established the kind of trials that we can do that can then try and establish. Um, whether or not my theory is correct. So this is the route that I'm really mm. going down and really pushing for because it's no good me pushing this theory if it's wrong. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm quite happy for it to be wrong. Obviously, I wouldn't want it to be wrong. Uh, we want to actually identify the underlying cause. But if it's wrong, there's no point in me advising my family and friends of a wrong theory because it's not going to benefit them. So I am really pushing hard to uh, go down that route. We've got potential investments coming in for phase one clinical trials but it's going to take time for that to happen. So there's that route. Um, uh, another thing is I'm contacting, um, I'm going to conferences and contacting oncologists. I was just speaking to um, uh, Professor Angus Dalgleish very recently uh, as, as he was at the conference that I met you at. Yeah. Uh, and doing those sort of things, just to try and spread the word in the, in the scientific community as well. Um, and as well as obviously going on these sort of podcasts and trying to... Um, disseminate the theory and book to cancer patients so that they can benefit from the information themselves at the same time. So yeah, it's kind of a three pronged approach. I'm just trying to really push the information out there, especially in the scientific realm uh, and to get it tested and evaluated and to try and identify a potential antifungal protocol that can be used for a, a large majority of cancers. Yeah, I mean, you've, you're not saying this, um, as you've just said, you, you know, if you're wrong, you don't want to push this on anybody. If and you're not saying it's a cure by any means. However, if people just improve their diet um, and the environment that they are in, they're going to reduce the risk, just the risk of getting these sort of problems. Or if they are on treatment, if they continue to eat well, and we know just basic, basic facts of life, if you eat well, de-stress and things, it's going to help. Yeah. It may not be the final cure but um it would certainly help and so i can't uh, recommend it, it enough because it's really opened my eyes and if i was to sit down with a tome and try and look at uh, what cancer is and how it works i don't know if i'd find another uh, book that has ri been written so well um thank so you very much. well very well done for that thank you um thank you mark for coming on the show and explaining it. it's been a real joy to have you um if people want to find out more uh, do you have a website? I do. It's called um, cellsuppression.com. I will leave the link in the description. And Thank presumably, you, you know, th with these things, people who have been diagnosed or know people have been diagnosed, and we do seem to be in an era of turbo cancer at the moment, uh, which I'm sure has got nothing to do with a certain medical intervention that's been uh, passed around recently. But if people do want to contact you, can they get, they can get in touch with the, um, th through the website? Yeah, through the website. I also am on LinkedIn. I also have a Facebook theory discussion page, which is growing and, and patients can come on board and discuss with each other the concepts of the theory and what they're doing in relation to treatment associated with the theory. And that's very, very promising because a lot of these people are very well informed. So that's another way you can reach me. Brilliant. Mark, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you for sending the book. Thank so, you, uh, Richard. Thank you. Really appreciate it, that. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. Uh, I, I will be back with more monologues and more wonderful guests. I'd be interested if anyone um, does want to contact Mark and um, let me know how it goes. And uh, we'll happily share any of your stories, any of your success stories as well. Um, I think we're all here to help each other. Till next time, thank you for watching. From Mark and I, take care and goodbye for now.